Thanks, Walter. Um, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Craig and I will be kind of ping-ponging a little bit, uh, which is the nature of, uh, of the partnership. Um, but just by way of uh, background, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Bureau Happold's uh, couple thousand person plus global engineering firm uh, who uh, I've personally had some wonderful uh, relationships with over a number of years and uh, worked on a number of projects with. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail on this because um, we're going to be moving on to kind of the nature of the partnership, but also by way of background, uh, my company, Hoberman Associates, is uh, premised on this idea of transformable design, which I will speak about for a little while in terms of ongoing projects that we have in this area and then segue into the work that we're doing with ABI. And together we formed the Adaptive Building Initiative, uh, which is premised on the idea that buildings will be different in the future and buildings need to be different in the future. And I think as we go through this, hopefully you'll get a, an idea of what our thinking is about that. Now, this gives you kind of, I guess, my trajectory of how I came to, uh, to ABI and to the notion of adaptive buildings and what had occurred to me kind of going in, I don't know, four or five years ago, and I wasn't, you know, I was sort of a late adopter to thinking about issues of sustainability, but it occurred to me that the specialty of making transformable structures was something that might have a special importance for sustainability. Now, how is that? Well, transformable, if you will, is like an idea of what the something does. It's transformable because it acts in a certain way, performs in a certain way, it changes its size, its shape, its surface. But it does that for a reason. In Ma many cases, I'm doing it, say, for pure entertainment, or in the case of toys, a kind of a physical interac interaction. Uh, but one can also think about transforming in response to the environment, in response to external, uh, the, the external environment. And it's this combination of the built environment responding to the external environment that struck me that this might have special opportunities for buildings that would save energy and lower their carbon footprint. So basically the movement from, in terms of my practice, is going from transformable to adaptive and sustainable. And at the core of this are some very, you know, key, uh, 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 I would say, inspirations. One is that it's based on nature. This is what nature does and we can learn from nature. The second is, is that this is a concept that is, like I'm calling design driven, which is to say that it is at its nature a kind of a, a, it's, it's, a it's not a, a sort of a signature author design concept, it's a design approach, it's a new capacity for design. And that in its uh, functional guise for buildings, it basically is something that needs to be integrated within all of the different building systems, other building systems, in order to become uh, actually useful. So um, I'm going to hand this over to Craig now, who's going to uh, basically speak to a larger context for the work. Um, we deal a lot with uh, all kinds of architects and, and all kinds of building approaches. And, you know, this, again, this issue about how energy impacts architecture is fascinating to me. You know, on the, on the left, you know, is the sort of Corbusian ideal of what the architecture should be, and I don't really care about the energy. And, and really the reality is the, on the right, is what you produce with this approach. And, and we can't just keep adding energy into buildings. One, one paradox of buildings is that older buildings actually use less energy per square foot. We have an energy density problem as well that, that's occurring because we are creating buildings that actually need more power, need more systems, need more stuff inside of them. And that's also a, a big deal in terms of trying to reduce our carbon. Um, I do think that there are signs that things are moving away from this, and we're moving away from necessary material entities, the buildings, and people. There's glimpses that people are starting to think about them as total energy systems. But I, you know, personally, I'm, I'm not seeing you know, this uh, as a widespread movement yet. Um, and just uh, to, to talk a little bit about energy reduction, get back into where, where, where Chuck and I actually cross, cross paths, is that in our current approach to energy, 
you know, we typically look at energy like this in terms of some passive strategies, the, 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 the going upwards, we talk about active strategies, which is basically system optimization, and finally renewables, which often we don't actually look at initially because they, they don't have very good paybacks, but the passive strategies is almost always where we look for the initial major uh, impacts for architectural form for, uh, and, and the impact of energy in, in terms of the planning and massing of a building. And a lot of this comes back down to the envelope. Um, the envelope of a building you know, controls your comfort, your light, your, ther your views, and, and the thermal barrier for the building. Um, now, this is where I start to, to question. We, 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 we often think of envelopes in a static way. Um, we think of buildings in a static way. Um, in, case, uh, in case in point, or, or actually, um, you know, often we think about uh, external barriers, and there are good examples of external shading. It's always good to have external shading on a building. It's often fixed. Um, it's a much better uh, way to actually block the energy before it comes into a building. And there's good shading precedents on this. And there's good shading precedents in general, but most of them are static. It's very rare that you actually see something that is, that is transformable or dynamic. And now this is the question. What, and this is a question that Chuck and I asked ourselves, what if we can start thinking about all these problems, this crossroads, of what if a building could self-optimize? What if a building could actually um, start to regulate itself? We have the ability. We have the ability to track the sun. We have the ability to know what the, the systems are doing inside. We have the ability to control the skin. So, you know, this is, a, this is a concept where we think that, you know, the, the inside of our spaces are not static. This space is not static inside. It's changing as we speak. There's more air coming into this to, to, to offset bodies, you know, within the space. So we need to continue to think about this idea of dynamic. This, this is just some diagrams about, about how I start to introduce at the bottom here time, okay? This is a typical, this is a sort of a typical W diagram of a building over a year where you get your heating loads drop off, your cooling loads come up, and your lighting loads stay roughly constant throughout a year. So you get these somewhat, you know, in, in sort of a, an area like New York in the United States, you might get this type of pattern of energy use you know, over a year. And this is actually the type of, looking over a year again, you, you see types of energy use in a building where, where you get these, these types of bars, and this is the type of analysis that we go through. But what if your, your facade could then adapt to that? What if it could self-regulate? What if it could actually control? Again, we know that the thermal envelope, the, the envelope of a building actually controls a significant portion of this energy coming into a building. Um, so this is, this, is, this is the thing, again, this is what I think about. Um, and this, this, this adaptive range is somewhat more than just the passive. It, it, it encapsulates lighting, encapsulates all kinds of other things that actually make it, I think, a more interesting and, and, uh, and uh, rich design solution. So, and, and this is not just a, sorry, this is not just us. Um, you know, we, the, the, the government now, which is great, um, is actually pushing this. The, the, the demand for zero energy buildings um, is, is recognizing these elements. And the amazing thing here is that, notice the thing at the bottom here, this is, the, this is a US federal research development agenda, is endorsed by the Department of Defense. I think that's great. <laughs> um, because you know, the, this, is, this is now seen as, as, as such a serious issue within, within government circles that the money is actually getting into the right hands for research. And I think that that is going to have a, a tremendous impact on the marketplace. So to, to think about some of these ideas, and, and I pose the question how this might actually um, affect. We, we, Chuck and I have, have thought a lot about these problems. We've applied them to some, some, some uh, projects. And we'll show you a number. Chuck will show you a number of projects. But we've kind of grouped them into three areas, this idea of permeability, which is really about uh, um, a, a kind of a a system where ventilation, thermal gain are, are, are at stake. This issue of opacity, where light control and solar gain are really the, the, the issue. Um, and uh, the, the final is this issue of growth, where you know, we actually need to actually adapt a specific space, not just simply an envelope, but actually a covering or something of that nature. And I think we've, we've seen the patterns of, of where we, we've been looking at these in buildings, and these are just these are sort of a general grouping of, of some ideas that, uh, that, that Chuck will elaborate on. Um, and 
how, again, just to emphasize this, how will adaptive performance be delivered? Um, the idea of an adaptive layer in an envelope is really interesting to me because we, we talk more and more about the envelope not as just a system, but a very multi-layered system. In our office, you know, as a structural engineer, you do the structure, it's almost kind of dumb. Um, you know, if you're the mechanical engineer, the mechanical systems. When you're in the envelope, there's all kinds of people involved in that, from lighting and, and uh, facades and energy, and it's a very rich area. And, and I think this area of adaptive nature is important because, you know, you can see this in an exterior skin, an encased interior, it can be anywhere within that envelope skin. So I'll, I'll hand it back to Chuck here in terms of uh, looking at some of these specific technologies. Identifying buildings, identifying the building envelope as being a critical part of buildings for reduction of energy. And then beginning to look at how this adaptive strategy uh, can help and here, you know, which that's a, a really a kind of an engineering driven argument. And from here, we're going to go into something that's really a kind of a hybrid between the design approach, which I was introduced, introducing earlier in the talk, and the engineering approach, which Craig is um, speaking about, which we're calling technologies, which are not pure technologies, but I will say, I'll call them design driven technologies. And I think you'll understand a little bit more as I get into it. Uh, over the years, uh, uh, I've developed a series of uh, systems, mechanisms, if you will, which have particular uh, applicability to uh, transformable surfaces. And those transformable surfaces potentially are the adaptive layer that Craig was speaking about. The linear system is, a, uh, is an extensible surface that can retract to a slender bundle. It kind of looks like it's rotating in the screen, but it's actually a series of, it's a counterbalance mechanisms with a series of slats which are folding up. The grid system is a transformable window. It's a kind of a new style of louver with uh, a frame and mullions that transforms. We have something called the frit system, which is taking the idea of the frit, which controls solar gain on glass, but by shifting layers, we can make a variable frit that has more or less opacity or transparency. And then what we're calling the perforated system, which is a bit of a hybrid between a couple of the last ones, which is uh, also a counterbalance mechanism that shifts perforated layers relative to each other. So these are the four systems that I'll be going into, but in the context of specific projects. Now, these four systems also have a direct relationship to the adaptive performance of growth, permeability, and opacity, and the different systems have different sweet spots, if you will, relative to those adaptive, uh, uh, those types of adaptive performance. So let's see how this works in the context of a few different uh, projects. Uh, over the years, um, I've been doing, uh, collaborating with Foster and Partners on several projects. Uh, one is for uh, a project in the Mideast in uh, Abu Dhabi called Elder Central Market, uh, which is a uh, multi uh, use development that has a large retail component, a kind of a modern day souk. And working with the Foster team, we developed a open air shading and ventilation roof uh, over a series of squares within uh, the souk. So these are made up of four meter square, quite large units uh, based on our grid system, which are shown responding and reacting to the sun and then seen underneath. Uh, so a project like this has both a, um, a kind of a pure environmental story and also has a very uh, uh, significant design story in terms of integrating this adaptive layer with the fixed shading uh, of the project at well, as well. Um, uh, this is a project which today I can't say for certain whether ultimately it will be built uh, or not. There's, uh, it's one of the main, many projects that has uh, components on hold based on the financial crisis. Uh, another project where we used uh, our uh, adaptive system was for a, an installation at the Museum of Modern Art last year. I don't know if, if maybe some of you saw a design in the Elastic Mind. We were commissioned by MoMA to build a, uh, a sculpture which we called Emergent Surface. An Emergent Surface is about an 18 foot high, doubly curved wall made up, some of, made up of some 24 uh, linear system units which are individually controlled uh, to create different patterns but that Programming basically could be adapted to uh, solar control or uh, 
uh, thermal control for an environmental barrier. So this was a kind of a sculptural expression of, uh, of an architectural idea. And I think it, you know, it's, to me it's very appropriate that this went into a design show. This is as much about design uh, as it is about technology. Now, the way that we, um, uh, the way that we form uh, these uh, uh, adaptive surfaces is, uh, is, is very methodical, and I'm going to walk you through conceptually how uh, I think and my group thinks about taking particular surfaces and uh, applying the adaptive layer to them. So what we can do is we can start with uh, different forms, and this is sequencing through some uh, basic forms, going from planar to more complex ones. Uh, but basically, it, it doesn't really matter what the form is. It's just conceptually showing you that you can kind of choose a form, which is ultimately the shape factor of the building. From there, we look at uh, subdividing the form, whether in a kind of an orthogonal grid or um, a die grid uh, or um, uh, a hexagonal subdivision. So as we go down this sort of uh, 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 branching structure, we have a ruled surface with a hexagon subdivision. And from there, we can apply one of our particular adaptive technologies to it, in this case, the linear system, which is shown folding up. Uh, but we could subdivide it in a different way. The same ruled surface could be subdivided in a rectangular division, and we could apply a different uh, system to that form, in this case, the grid system. So we end up with the same uh, basic shape and basic form, but a different subdivision and a different, uh, uh, and a different adaptive uh, layer or adaptive technology. And in this case, this could also be applied to sort of a more of a free form as well. Um, this, by the way, is up on our website uh, as, a, as a direct interactive. It's fun to play with, but I think it also is conceptually beginning to sort of uh, uh, map out a relationship between design and technology. And sometimes I think about these technologies as they're technologies that are designed for the designer, which is to say that we put together these technologies so that basically they can be highly customized and not only customized by, you know, the sort of the geeky engineers, but also that architectural designers can interact with it and basically extend out their design vocabulary into this new area. Uh, as part of this, we're looking at not only the uh, formation of these different elements, but also about their interactive control. This is a little applet showing how a facade is reacting to the sun icon. Uh, we're able to kind of focus it into, uh, you know, a smaller or larger area. And all this, this in a way is a kind of a cartoon. This is, a, this is in fact the reality of what is absolutely achievable in facades today in terms of responsive performance. Um, I'll take another project by Foster and go into a bit more detail uh, to kind of, as a kind of a case study of how we are bringing this adaptive uh, performance and adaptive layer into a, into a project. Uh, this is a um, uh, project uh, called City of Justice, which is a series of law courts in Madrid. And this project, while it is on hold due to the financial crisis, pretty sure to be built. Uh, so that's, um, uh, we're, we're looking forward to that. It's basically a series of buildings. Uh, Foster has two of them. They did the master plan. Other architects are working on others. Uh, they're all circular in plan. And the Foster team asked us to develop uh, an adaptive shading system for uh, a, a series of atria within the buildings. The colored areas represent some 20,000 square feet of these multi-story <coughs> atria. As part of our design, we developed a hexagonal version of our linear unit, which can be adapted to, di to different shapes. And shown here is the central atrium of one of the buildings uh, with our um, uh, or with our adaptive shades, which are under the glazing in this case, uh, reacting to the light. So the architect is, uh, of course, interested in the environmental performance, but also in creating, in creating a particular kind of experience for the space. In this case, really, the image was dappled sunlight coming through trees. Uh, the particular designs that we have are uh, developed uh, parametrically. That is to say that they can be customized, adapt through uh, uh, design programs for different different spaces. This is a kind of horseshoe shaped space that has some 14 different shades which basically map to the uh, roof. And then that data is uh, uh, basically output into a series of uh, into tabular form and the construction documents uh, and these uh, all of this has gone out for um, uh, tender bids to a series of manufacturers 
but basically there's a lot of automation of the design development process uh, so that the manufacturers can kind of get this as a kind of a digestible package to deliver. Now, equally important to the physical design of these is, actually, is, is all of the, uh, the controls and the logic of the controls, but this diagram is speaking more to the controls from a hardware standpoint. So each of the shapes represents a different space. Each of those spaces has a sub-controller, which report to a master controller for the entire shading system, which in turn reports to the, uh, uh, to the, to the building management system. Um, and there's a lot of uh, design specification that goes into that as well, which ultimately is packaged by the supplier into a, uh, you know, into a complete uh, offering. As we went through the um, process of uh, working with the Foster team and designing it, we basically worked with them to come up with a kind of a dis uh, control algorithm of when we want direct light, when we want indirect light, and when we want um, complete, uh, complete shading. Uh, to help us in terms of, um, uh, uh, in, in terms of working out that algorithm, uh, our team uh, developed custom tools. This is a little application in Studio Max where a sun icon can control our shading objects. And what we came up with was the idea that this shows the central space with the shades completely retracted and you see the sun sweeping overhead. But the, um, uh, the logic was, that the feeling was that we can allow sunlight to reach the floor but not the walls. In the floor on the concourse it will create a certain sparkle and vibrancy but the walls have offices which would be heated up. So this shows a simulation of the shades in action, and you can see here that the sun is reaching the uh, floor but not the walls. But I'd like you to just sort of extend this idea out a little bit and think about what this means. It means that we're actually sculpting with light and shadow within a space with these systems. And I think that that's a fantastic opportunity because, as I see it, this is really, you know, a kind of an architectural value for lighting. That, has been, that really has just been hardly, where the surface has hardly been scratched because we can come up with all kinds of different uh, control algorithms and lighting schemes to create different qualities for spaces, which are all determined post-occupancy. You don't have to decide in advance uh, everything. You have to have a good idea, obviously, but once the space is actually occupied, it can be endlessly optimized and tuned. And this shows the uh, uh, roof of the central atrium for at different days of the year and how the shades respond. All of this data is also given as part of the tender package because the manufacturer ultimately is responsible for delivering the system with this type of performance built in. And this ultimately is what uh, the architect wants to see, which is a space that is sparkling, that's vibrant. Remember, Madrid is high desert, and in a glazed space, you're going to get this intense, intense uh, uh, thermal uh, 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 effect and if you have fixed shading, you end up with a very drab space, and what they wanted was something much more, much more alive, much more alive. 